All right, in our lives, we have uh, kind of an aversion to kings. Uh, and if we ever look at history, we can kind of understand why we don't like monarchs, why we don't like kings uh, trying to rule our lives. Uh, in England, they did a survey about two years ago or so. Uh, and in this survey, they asked, which was the worst king in all of English history? And the answer was a guy by the name of Henry VIII. Uh, Henry VIII, uh, we know him usually because we have to remember that he had uh, six wives. And if you're like me in high school, you had to remember what their uh, demise were, right? One was divorced, the other was beheaded, the third one died. Then you got divorced, beheaded, survived, survived. The last one did not die, outlived King Henry. I, and, and, and I don't remember any of their names except for the second one, whose name was Anne Boleyn. Like, that's the only thing I remember about those ladies except for their demise, what happened to them. All right, and, 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 and we think about that, but that's not the only reason why King Henry VIII was considered a bad king. Uh, one historian estimates that Henry, in his lifetime, ordered the execution of over 70,000 people. And that's a lot of people, and, I, and, and a lot of historians would say, well, that's probably rather high estimates, but it does show you what type of person he was. He was very quick to have other people killed. Uh, Henry was constantly taking England into war, uh, and usually wars that he was not very good at winning. Uh, I don't know of any war that Henry actually was successful in. Oftentimes he lost. Uh, another thing that happened is Henry... Uh, when he came into power, he had all this money that his dad had left him. And by the time he died, there was hardly any money left in the English coffers. And so there's a lot of reasons why Henry is considered a bad king. And there's a lot of things within Henry's profile that for us, we look at a no number of years later and say, man, that's why we don't have kings anymore. And so we like to be independent. We like to have our own system of government, whether that's republics or dem democracies or whatever form of government it is. But it causes a problem within us as individuals. See, as individuals, we don't like to be told what to do. And that's why I think we have so much problems with kings is because they tell us what, what they expect from us and they expect us to do it. In our lives, there is a throne sitting at the center of who we are, and many times we are unwilling to place a king upon that throne. Rather, we'd rather have ourselves there. And we sit there and we order our lives, and if we're truthful about it, many times the, our lives is just crumbling around us and we really don't have an answer for what to do next. In the book of Mark, we come across a chapter that just drips with this idea of kingship. It's Mark chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open up with me there. And we want to read this passage of Scripture that just shows the importance of kings. Uh, this is what it says. Uh, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there. Uh, no one has ever ridden it. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, just simply say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. So the disciples went and they found a colt outside the street tied at a doorway and they untied it. And some people standing there asked, what are you doing? Why are you untying this colt? And they answered as Jesus told them to and the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks upon it and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches that had cut, they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went to the temple courts and he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. 
Uh, this is what's often called the triumphal entry of Jesus, and it's because it reminds us of a triumph parade. It's not necessarily because Jesus has had victory over anything at this point in time, but rather it's this, this idea of something within the Roman uh, culture at the time. Uh, in 2015, the Kansas City Royals won the World Series. Uh, it was the first time they had won it uh, since uh, 30 years. So 1985 was the last time they had won it. And the first thing that they did in Kansas City is they threw a parade. And we have some pictures here. And, and they estimated that about 255,000 people showed up to line the streets to get a glimpse much like this one where you can barely see anything just to celebrate this victory. And every year, sports teams, professional sports teams, win the championship in their hometowns. They have these parades, these victory parades. And it's the closest thing I can to get you to understand what a triumph parade in the Roman time was. The Roman Empire was very much about conquering and uh, early on in their history, they would send out their generals with the armies to go out and to fight, and they were very good fighters, and they often won. And when the Roman generals came back to Rome after having victory, they would ride through the streets of Rome in their chariots, and behind them would be their armies, and behind that would be the spoils of their war. And they would come into Rome, and the city of Rome would gather together, and they would celebrate around the streets and parade in victory. And what Jesus does here, rather than riding in a chariot but on a donkey, he does something very similar to what the Roman generals would have done. He rides in triumph. And so we call it the triumphal entry. It happened on Palm Sunday because the branches that the uh, Israelites were laying in front of Jesus and waving, John tells us, were palm branches. And so it's very interesting uh, to see all of this happen. Uh, Jesus, they come to this town of Bethphage and Bethany. Uh, these are outer towns we assume are located on the Mount of Olives. Uh, and, and it's kind of a sign for them that they have almost made it to Jerusalem. Uh, Bethany is the last city between Jerusalem and Jericho, and if you traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's a very dusty and windy place, not a lot of vegetation. And when you get to Bethany, when you get to the Mount of Olives, there's finally greenery, and it serves as a visual aid that you are almost there. Uh, today I'm going to be traveling to my parents' house to attend a conference on Monday. And, and when I travel to my parents' house, at the road that turns off to go from the main road to my parents' house, there is this radio tower. And it has a big bright red light. And when you're traveling at night, you can see that light for a couple miles away. And when I see that light, I know I'm 10 minutes from my parents' house. I've almost made it. I've been driving forever. I'm ready to be done. And for the pilgrims of Israel, as they travel to Jerusalem, this is what the Mount of Olives would have served for them. They are there. They are ready to be done. And it's a joyful occasion. I mean, they're traveling there to celebrate and worship God at the Temple Mount. Well, Jesus sends two of his disciples into Bethany to get this colt, and they're told to say that the Lord needs this. That word for Lord can also be the same word for owner. And so it's very likely that Jesus, within his retinue, has a person who owns a colt, uh, and, and Jesus is talking to him, said, I need to ride it. And his owner's like, yes, go do it. And so when the is disciples go into town and get the colt and they have this conversation, it kind of explains why there's not more hesitation from the people there, right? The owner of this colt needs it, he'll return it. And they go, okay. And so he gets this colt and and notice it says that it's never been ridden on, and, and that's important. Uh, animals that were dedicated towards sacred usage in the Old Testament, the only way they could be used is if they've never been used for anything else. 
And so Jesus, riding on this colt, is saying there is something sacred about what is happening here. And so it was important that this colt had never been ridden on. And as they are walking into the town, the people are crying out, Hosanna, which simply means God save us. And there's praise. And when they get into the town, the crowds disperse after that. It's been a long day. They finally reach there. Uh, we're told that Jesus goes outside of Jerusalem. And, be, and on the major festival holidays, that's usually when there was huge crowds in Jerusalem. And the only places to stay were outside. And so Jesus will stay in the town of Bethany throughout this week. Uh, throughout this passage, there is one key central thing that's being said over and over again if we can understand it. And it's the idea that Jesus is the king. And we see this by understanding a few Old Testament passages that Jesus, I think, alludes to on purpose. The first one comes from Genesis chapter 49. Uh, in that passage, we have uh, Jacob on his deathbed, and he starts to call in all of his 12 sons. And as one son comes in, he blesses him. And as the next son comes in, he blesses him. And we finally get in verse 8 to Judah, and he begins to bless Judah. And in verses 10 and 11, we read these words. The scepter will not pass from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come. And the obedience of the nations shall be his, and he will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. Jacob is looking at his son Judah and says, Judah, you will rule your brothers. And when we look at Old Testament history, we see that besides the first king, all the other kings came from Judah, and in particular from the family of David. And so the messianic hope of the Israelites that there would be a king that arises and overthrows the government, it couldn't just be anyone, it had to be a certain one. A certain person, from a certain family, from a certain tribe. And Jesus fulfills that. He is the one. He is from the family of David. He is from Judah. And he is declaring himself the king. And notice what it says here at the end of verse 10. That the scepter will not pass until he who it belongs to comes. And Jacob is looking ahead to where Jesus the Messiah would come and says he is the one we're waiting for. Most importantly in this passage is what takes place there in verse 11 when it says that he has a donkey, a colt. And Mark doesn't tell us that the colt that Jesus is riding on is a donkey. It's Matthew that we get that information from. And so Jesus is riding into town on a donkey into the city of David as the king. And he's declaring himself as king. Second passage we have to look at is Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah writes in the time of the Persian, and a lot of his writing has to do with, with judgments against the nations. But also within Zechariah, there's this promise that if the Israelites will return to God, God will return to them. And so there's encouragement on Zechariah's part for the Israelites to forget about the exile and come back to God. The reason why they're in exile is because they forgot God. And in the middle of his prophecy, in chapter 9, we read this. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Uh, Zion's just another name for one of the mountains that Jerusalem sits upon. So it's a, a representation of Jerusalem. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. S uh, shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a, a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
See, it's pretty clear to us looking at it 2,000 years later that what Jesus is doing in Mark chapter 11 is clearly proclaiming, I am the King. And everything that he does in this passage, he does on purpose. And the people, they are standing there and they are shouting out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which comes from Psalm 118. Uh, Psalms 113 to 118 were traditionally sung by the Jews as they pilgrimed to Jerusalem to celebrate the various festivals. And so they probably are singing this as part of tradition, but also the Israelites in that time period took Psalm 118 to be messianic, to talk about the Messiah. And it's significant that as Jesus is riding to town, Psalm 118 is what's being shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna. 200 years before Jesus does this, the Israelites rebelled against the oppression of the Seleucid Empire. And after they rebelled, they were led by a group of people known as the Maccabees, one of them named Simon Maccabees, decided to ride into Jerusalem after they had liberated it. And as he rides into Jerusalem, we see, we're told that the people lined the streets and they began to throw their coats on the ground. And you don't usually do this. This is the Middle East. It's dusty. You don't put your coat on the ground for women. You don't put your coat on the ground for the elderly. You don't do it except for kings. And as Simon rides in victorious into Jerusalem, they're waving palm branches. They're throwing their coats on there. And Simon is coming as king. And Jesus, 200 years later, imitates what Simon did. I don't know how many of the people that are there that day recognized exactly what Jesus was doing, but we are told in the other Gospels that the religious leaders did. And they're angry. And they're mad. And they ask Jesus, Jesus, why would you do this? Jesus is making it pretty clear that he is the king. I think the reason why we are so adverse to kings in our lives is because they can be tyrants at times. They can be dictators. We look at Henry VIII and we think to ourselves, man, that is not a good guy. And he got away with it all. And he was able to because he was in charge. So sometimes we are hesitant to accept kings in our lives, but if we are honest with ourselves, we look at Jesus and he's a little bit different. See, Jesus is a benevolent king. He is a king that cares for his people. He's a king that's willing to die for his people. And as he rides into Jerusalem this day, he declares that he is king and that he's there for them. In this passage, I think there's three things we can learn about Jesus' kingship. Three things that Jesus gives us if we're willing to submit ourselves and allow him to be enthroned in our lives. The first one is this, is I think Jesus gives us assurance in our lives. And we read about it in those first six verses, especially verses four and six. Jesus tells his disciples to go into town and to go find this donkey, and if people ask, just tell them that this, this sentence, and they're going to let you have it. I mean, Bethany is a small town. Everybody knows everybody. There's a reason why they're kind of suspicious, because these two guys, they've never seen before. Why are you taking this goat? I know whose who's donkey this belongs to. It's not yours. Why are you taking it? And, and they simply say this thing that Jesus tells them to say through his wisdom and his knowledge, and they allow him to go. There's a lot of scary things in our lives. And I think the most scariest thing that we oftentimes allow to affect us the most is the future. I mean, the future can be scary for many of us. You know, we wonder 
if our jobs are going to work out. We wonder if we're going to have enough money to pay the bills this month. We wonder if we're going to be able to eat the next meal. We wonder how our kids are going to turn out. And there's so many things that, that we begin to worry about what is going to happen. And it would be awesome if we could just snap our fingers and everything would be just fine and peachy. It would be awesome if we could take a, a, a binoculars and look into the future and know that everything turns out all right. But we can't. But we have a king who can control all of those things. We have a king who wants to take care of us. We have a king who loves us. And so when we worry, we, we we're worrying because we don't have control. And we're unwilling to give Jesus control. Jesus says it best in Matthew chapter 6. It will appear on the screen here. It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable? Can any one of you add to your life by worrying? Too often we worry. And there's, and there's a lot of things to worry about. I understand that. I worry at times too. But we have a king who says, don't worry. And the only way we can get to that place where we can stop worrying is by trusting that Jesus is going to take care of it. By allowing him to be king in our lives and allowing him to take care of the things. It doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy. It doesn't mean that we're going to be, not have financial crises. All right? It doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect, but Jesus will get us through. Uh, the second thing in this passage I think we see is that Jesus brings peace to our lives. And we see that in Mark verses 7 and 8. You know, as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, he rides on a donkey. And I don't know about you, but donkeys aren't necessarily the most used animals. Not the one I would choose. While they may go as fast as horses, typically they don't because they're just not inclined to. You have to really motivate them to get them to move. They're not the most beautiful animals. I mean, there's a lot of things about donkeys that that's not what I would choose. And if I were a king riding into town, I would probably choose a horse. But Jesus, he rides on this donkey because it is a symbol of peace. He rides on it because he's humble enough to sit on this beast of burden. He rides on it because he comes not to conquer, or at least not to conquer people. And he rides in as a king that is different than what we expect. The most important image in the New Testament about King Jesus is that he is a shepherd king. That he's looking after his people. And when we're in this midst of turmoil in our lives, when we're worrying about what is going to happen next, Jesus comes in and he wants to provide us with peace. And he rides on this donkey to show, I am a prince of peace. And he wants you to have peace. And if we're honest with ourselves, if we can get to that place where we're not worrying what's left, is peace. But most importantly, Jesus wanted us to have peace, not just within ourselves, but with God. Paul in Romans 5 will say that, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. And the ultimate thing that Jesus came to bring into this world was this peace between us, the sins that had separated us from God, that had caused enmity between us and Him. It is done away with because of Jesus being king. Uh, the last thing that we see in this passage 
is that Jesus wants to bring joy into our lives. And we see that in the reaction of the crowd in verses 9 and 10. They are there shouting out, Hosanna! And that word means God saves, but it tended to be a word of joy that people would just shout out when they were happy, Hosanna! The King is coming! Hosanna. And when we get done with worrying, we're left with this place where peace is in our lives and joy should follow. But when we worry, too often times we allow our joy to be sapped. When we're caused worrying about the future and not knowing what is next, we oftentimes allow our happiness to be drained away. And we're left miserable. We're left unhappy. And Jesus is saying, I want you to have joy. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 4 when he says, Rejoice. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you see this? That word for anxious is worry. Do not worry. Because we have a king who cares. Do not worry because we have a king who wants to hear our prayers and our petitions. We have a king who took our place. We have a king who died the death we deserved. We have a king who wants to give us peace that transcends all understanding. And if we have that peace, the natural reaction, Paul says, is to rejoice. Rejoice. Our King wants to guard our hearts and our mind. Our King wants to be there for us. Because Jesus is a benevolent King. And He cares for you. At the end of this passage, we see kind of a a dichotomy exists. In verses uh, 9 and 10, there's rejoicing outside of the city gates, but the moment he enters into Jerusalem, there's nothing. We're not told about anything that's happening. And what we have here is two different reactions to Jesus. We have the crowds who are excited, who are ecstatic, who are saying, this is our king. And then we have people who are silent. And on that throne inside your heart, you get a choice. Are you going to let Jesus be king of your lives? Are you going to allow Jesus to sit and rule over all aspects of you? Are you going to be like the people of the city and not even talk about it? We have a king who wants to rule over us. And while we can be kind of hesitant to allow kings in our lives, this king is better than any other king that's ever existed. And he wants to take care of us. And he wants to do what is best for us. Are we allowing him to rule over us? It's our choice. You get to choose. Will you let Jesus be the benevolent king of your life? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this entry of Jesus and everything that it teaches us about who he was. And I pray that in my life I can be one of those who are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is the Lord. I pray, God, that we will choose each of us, to allow Jesus to be king, to allow him to reign over everything that we do.
I'm grateful for the sacrifice he paid, for him taking my spots. It's to him I give my allegiance to. Amen.